But I do want to ask you, because you are a very new president at an institution that stands at a crossroads, and you have a vision for this university, how hopeful are you about higher education? Have the embers died out? Where, I mean, what's your mood, maybe, is my question. I'm broadly a cultural pessimist, I suppose, while being a university optimist, right? And that maybe is one of the exciting things about being a university president is that you do get to keep the embers, right, till another day arises, that you can pursue a different world, right, that is, well, frankly, almost countercultural today, right, and that you can keep those kind of things alive until a day arises maybe when they are more valued than they are today. You know, to be a writer who I know you love, who I would recommend instead of Alan Bloom, like Alastair McIntyre. Yes. Right? That we yes, are, he's way better than Alan That will be the institutional St. Benedict that he calls for, you know, at the end of his book. Right? Uh-huh. And, right, that leads, like, a, a change of, like, valuation of mm-hmm. things, right? That's what a university, that's what I'm excited about, what a university can be. Hey, everyone. You're listening to Sacred and Profane Love a podcast in which philosophers, theologians, and literary critics discuss how literature can help us think more deeply about love, happiness, and meaning in human life. I am your host, Jennifer Frey, and I am an associate professor of philosophy at the University of South Carolina. In this episode, I speak with the president of the University of Tulsa, Brad Carson, about Alan Bloom's The Closing of the American Mind. I had been invited to Tulsa by Brad to address the value of a liberal arts education, so I thought it would be fun to discuss Bloom with him. It's an episode that's a bit off script for this podcast, but no less important for that. As always, I hope you enjoy our conversation. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Sacred and Profane Love. I am excited to be here in Tulsa, Oklahoma at the University of Tulsa. And this afternoon, I'm speaking with their new president, Brad Carson, about Alan Bloom's influential book, The Closing of the American Mind. Welcome to the podcast, Brad. Thanks. I'm honored to be here. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while and looking forward to this visit. So thanks for having me down here in Tulsa. You know, I guess for me, it's been kind of wild rereading this book because the first time I read it, I don't know, I was 19 or 20, I was in college, and I was at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana, and it resonated with me, at least the framing of it. So, you know, the, the first part where he introduces this idea of, you know, what it, what it means for the American mind to close, and his concerns about a kind of cultural relativism that is pervasive outside our universities, but even inside of our universities. And just his vision of the university as having philosophy at the center. All of this deeply resonated with me. But then I, you know, I didn't read it again until last week. (laughs) And I, I feel like in significant respects, it holds up. But you read it for the first time. And so I'm, I'm just curious what your initial impression of this was. So we're about the same age, and the book came out when I was in college. And it was one of those big books, like Paul Kennedy's Rise and Decline of the Great Powers and Closing of the American Mind that everyone talked about, but very few people read. But people kind of talked about the more interesting debates that made popular culture. So when I was in college, I remember seeing this book on all of the shelves, and mostly the discussion was about his views of rock music (laughs) or perhaps about sexual liberation in some way. Yeah. And I must say, when I was... 20, they didn't really resonate with me much. Right. And even today, don't too much. Yeah. But having read the book now for the first time, I have to say that the arguments, which are far broader than those two things I brought up, far yeah. more profound. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, could, I would probably agree with Alan Bloom on much of what he says, although I don't particularly think the book is worth reading. <laughs> Okay. So it's not going on your recommended reading list. I mean, look, it could have been shorter. I think we can agree about that. It's a bit bloated. I think he is at times obviously self-indulgent. I feel like he 
he's intentionally trying to push buttons. He's trying to be provocative. I think, you know, he's he's trying to create a stir, which and he was successful in all of those respects. But I think he hits on some home truths, you know, that kind of deeply resonate. And I think that he's picking up on some stuff that, you know, is is still important. I mean, let's talk about his principal diagnosis, right? So he he opens up the book with this contrast between two kinds of openness, right? There's this kind of openness of indifference that he associates with a kind of unreflective cultural relativism where like you don't want to be a partisan for a particular culture, for a particular place, for a particular point of view, because if you're right, then somebody else is wrong and that seems judgy or bad or I don't know, somehow creating conflict. And this kind of openness, the openness of indifference, he thinks is is bad. It's It makes educating a person impossible. And that, like, at the end of the day, it's it's completely inauthentic because we have to, like, by nature, right, we have to make judgments. We do, in fact, have values that we have to live our lives by. And at any rate, it leads to a kind of closing, right? You're closed off to the search for truth because you don't really believe in truth if you're a relativist, if you're indifferent. And so the contrast is between a kind of openness of indifference and then an openness that is an openness of actual free inquiry, like an openness to finding what is true. So kind of doggedly pursuing the truth. And, you know, ultimately having the courage to stand for what you think is true in the face of various obstacles and and problems and and conflicts, right? And I like this contrast, right? I mean, I think it is true that if in the university space we're not, if we don't have the self-conception or the self-understanding that, you know, what we're doing is, is we're searching for the truth, we might disagree about what the truth is. We might have different methods for getting on it, but like ultimately that is the good that we're after, right? And is the measure of whether you've attained knowledge or mere opinion or something else. And that universities have to be willing to say that, right? <laughs> say that truth is, is a good, it's what we are, we are an institution dedicated, you know, to pursuing and that we, we, we can't be indifferent. I'm sympathetic with what you said, and I think you made the argument that Alan Bloom makes that took me two weeks to get through in (laughs) kind of turgid prose. And so I think the complaint that I leveled against Alan Bloom there at the outset was not that he isn't right about a lot of this. It's just that if I were going to recommend to a student or maybe even a peer, it's like, are you interested in kind of what's happening at the university or how broader cultural trends are affecting the university and what the university should be about? Because for Alan Bloom, the university is the fundamental institution in our society. Mm -hmm. What our society should be about, I can think of about six people who would be more interesting. Uh So I think your history that you gave there in two minutes was much more interesting to me than the book itself was. And so from my perspective, you're very interested in his ideas. Yeah. And I'm sympathetic with that. Yeah. I'm not sure that the book is, uh, that the juice is worth the squeeze in terms of the book. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Fair point. Fair point. Well, let's talk about, so one point that Bloom makes that I do think is worth discussing. So this is a quote Bloom writes that every true educational system has a moral goal that it tries to attain and that informs its curriculum and that we need to articulate whatever our shared goal is as educators. Um, And he also says that in looking at our students, like we have to reflect on what we think they should learn in order to call themselves educated, right? So we have to have an idea of what an educated human looks like if we're gonna reflect in a meaningful way on university curriculum. And I'm just wondering if you agree with that. And if you do agree with that, you know, what what is the shape of that ideal type of person? I do agree with that, although I might disagree slightly with Bloom in thinking that we 
offer that rather than that we inherit that for the broader society. So in many ways, what Bloom complains about in the book and how the university has fallen down on the job is a broader cultural complaint, and the universities reflect that. And I think that's an important part of this is that right, his views of like relativism or his concern that every student he teaches is a relativist um, and that we've kind of lost our way is his way of saying to me that the broader culture has lost its way, which, again, I'm very sympathetic to that. And I can find other writers I find more interesting, polemical, persuasive, rhetorical on that very subject. And I do think, though, um, that he's in – good company in that, in my mind. So the question is, yes, does the university have to have a goal in mind? I think it does. And I think most people on the left or the right in the university would say it does too. You know, we have a core curriculum at the University of Tulsa. Most universities do have some vestige of a core curriculum. It may not be the great books curriculum. It may be beyond the Greco-Roman world, but there is a core curriculum where people say you have to know these things. But maybe where Bloom would differ from contemporary practice is that Bloom sees this as part of human flourishing, that we're going to teach you the things it takes to be a human being, Mm -hmm. as opposed to these are cultural, these are, this is cultural literacy for you, kind of E.D. Hirsch's view of that, another book from this era that kind of made a stir to say like, yeah, you have to know these kinds of things if you're going to function, if you're going to understand debates and politics or how the world works, right? You have to know these things. And so core curriculum has taken maybe away from this view of like, this is what you have to know to be a flourishing human to this is the functional knowledge you have to have to succeed in a globalized world. Mm, Yeah. I mean, I'm far more attracted to the bloom picture that, you know, what an education is, is the cultivation of a person. And, you know, for a university, it's the cultivation of your mind. So that not so that you become rich or that you, you know, satisfy your own ambitions or that you achieve status or that you achieve power or that you achieve wealth, but that you become free. But is that are those mutually exclusive goals, I guess. Because to say you have to know these things to succeed in the world, right, that this is cultural literacy, um, strikes me as part of human flourishing, too. If you want to get by, you should know these things about how others work. But I guess I think just getting by is um, a meager a meager goal. I mean, if we're talking about higher education, we want you to do more than get by. And I think we want to call you to something higher. And that higher aspiration or goal would be for you to, through study, to confront, you know, what you believe and ask yourself probably for the first time, why do you believe that? And not just for any of your beliefs, you know, it's a waste of time to ask yourself, you know, why you believe I don't know that your phone number is what it is, but, you know, why do you believe what you believe about the good society if, in fact, you have any really reflective beliefs about it or whether or not you're just aping whatever your parents told you or whatever your friends think or whatever you hear on the radio or you read in the New York Times because they're not really your beliefs unless you understand why, unless you have an account of them, right? And, you know, just getting by in the world, while necessary, you know, it may be that the world is is bad in various ways. <laughs> and if you're just getting by, then you don't have the capacity to see the things that need to be changed because you don't have the vision, I can accept that. But again, I don't think it excludes other forms of knowledge, right, or other subjects you study. I mean, I guess the question to you is, what is the ideal Jennifer Frey University look like? And I'll pose this as <laughs> maybe an opening answer. That was supposed to be my question to you. <laughs> because, no, I mean, I, I often hear, as you're a philosopher, and philosophers try to contrast this vision of what the the end of education should be with the more shall we say, mercantile aspects of Mm -hmm. the university today. Mm -hmm. But we talked 
earlier today when we were having breakfast about how influential these medieval thinkers were in your own development. And if you look at Abelard or Bonaventure or Duns Scotus, they weren't being subsidized by a university endowment like philosophers are at the University of South Carolina, where you are, or the University of Tulsa here. Right? They were entrepreneurs of a sort, intellectual entrepreneurs, right? having to find students who would become acolytes and then pay for right, the privilege of studying at their feet. And of course, most of the students were literate in law or theology, which had, they used were the, the business school degrees of their day. Right? These were vocational in, in nature. And so hasn't it always been a world where these things were mixed together, life of the mind with disciplines that maybe were more practical in orientation? Um, and it goes back to the very origins of the university in the 12th century. Sure. So the, yeah, so the origins of the university definitely had law and medical faculties, but I don't think the comparison between medicine and business is apt just because the the medical faculty and the law faculty are in, are in some sense, you know, arts that are, they're necessary for human life. But, you know, we're working under conception where law is associated with virtue, right? The, the purpose of law is to make men virtuous. We would no longer say this, but the medievals would. And the purpose of medicine is, is to heal. There is within both of these disciplines and in a liminable moral spiritual dimension that I think is plainly lacking in a, you know, in a, in a business school. No, I disagree with you there. That's a slander in my mind on business because, and it's easy to do that because we, you try to juxtapose life of the mind with like the grubbiness of, of cash. But what is the study of business? It's the organization of society and how one chooses to distribute goods among people. And that is, if you think, if you've said medicine is in your acceptable Jennifer Frey curriculum, then business, which is that exact same kind of question, except perhaps has less coolness to it these days, strikes me as being there too. Well, I don't know why I would say business is less cool. I mean, they certainly attract way more majors and donors and money. But Alan Bloom and you don't. You have no veneration of the business degree. No, that's true. But I'm not so sure that we're paragons of cool either. <laughs> <laughs> so, that could be. <laughs> so, but it goes back to like my question about claim. Abelard. Abelard had to recruit students who paid him. But today, I mean, I'll maybe play devil's advocate because I don't really believe that as a university president, this is how we should organize ourselves. But, you know, the complaint about philosophy as it's being shut down in many schools across the nation is that the students are voting with their feet and people aren't adverse to philosophy, qua philosophy. It's just that the programs aren't successful. And if Abelard wasn't able to recruit students, right, he would have gone hungry. And so aren't the philosophers asking for something different than the people who you find your own inspiration from? Well, I completely reject a kind of consumer model for education because, um, and this, I mean, so part of my complaints go back to b various 19th century reforms in the American university, but also I have some complaints with the Humboldtian model where it's sort of like you kind of construct your own course of study. I think that it's not obvious that, um, it's not obvious to me that that's the best model. It's not obvious to me that um, the distribution of disciplines into majors was a, was a great idea. I think sometimes we forget that it wasn't always that way. And in fact, that's a new, that's a new thing, but it's, you know, it's, it's a little bit ridiculous to me to say to the philosopher, well, students just aren't choosing philosophy. And the reason why I think that's ridiculous isn't because it's not true. It obviously is true. But what kind of choice are we giving them? They don't know what philosophy is. When they go to their advising uh, sessions, there's not a single advisor that is even telling them there are philosophy courses. They'd have to have, I don't know, by some miracle of grace, <laughs> some kind of insight into the value of it. And I mean, in my case, I just stumbled onto philosophy by accident. 
And it could have gone a different way, right? And so it's, I mean, if it's a choice, then it's a choice that's really loaded in a lot of different ways against philosophy because philosophy is not taught in K through 12. If you go into your local Barnes and Noble and you go to the philosophy section, you'll find like books on crystals and like maybe something watered down on Nietzsche. But you will, you will actually find, you know, the richness of our philosophical tradition presented in a serious way. There aren't philosophers on television that students are aware of or could imitate. There is no real way for them to see in their imagination <laughs> what on earth they would do with philosophy, what that even is. So I think that, you know, we have to kind of question this idea that you go up to the website, you look at all these majors, there's no guidance. And, and at any rate, what is a student thinking? right? The students are, are habituated from very early on to understand their education in instrumental terms, right? So K through 12, they understand their education in terms of getting into college. And then once they're in college, it's like, well, now I need to get a high paying job or some kind of, you know, life sustaining career where life sustaining tends to be cashed out in somewhat materialistic terms. And, you know, philosophy loses out on that model, as does history, as does increasingly literature, as does classics, et cetera, et cetera, right? Because it doesn't fit in the space of instrumental reasoning. And it shouldn't fit in that space because, in fact, it's something higher. Um, I'll accept all of that. But I think you've, to me, pointed to what the larger problem is, which is the culture. I think there's an incredible hunger for the humanities. And you witness this, for example, in seeing people who are downloading history podcasts. I mean, I knew more people who study very vocational things in college. They love reading about you know, the Romans or mm-hmm. the World War II. And there are people who do some fantastic production. I used to listen to my son in the car every day, every day, and my philosophy podcast. It was really amazing. Mm-hmm. And it had you know, tens of thousands of subscribers. Mm -hmm. And I think there's actually a real hunger for it. And I think, doesn't every young person ask, what is truth? What is beauty? Is there a God? What's the meaning of life? I think it's more than simply a marketing problem for philosophy. It's that people still are interested in those subjects a lot and in their private lives, debate them and think about them. It's that whether it's the expense of the university or the broader kind of vocational, instrumental nature of our culture have chosen not to study history or philosophy or literature. And I think there's still incredible appetite for it. So I think it's more than a marketing question. It's that people don't see college as a place to go and develop themselves into a higher human being, as you would do, I think, to see it as being, or as Bloom would see it as doing, right? to introduce ideas that make you, yeah, make you a better human. I think people are thinking about their job afterwards. And that's an indictment on the culture. And maybe on the university to some extent that we acquiesce in that or accommodate it and don't push back enough against it. I think those are all true. But I look around, I think, as Blue might say, it's a broader cultural issue. And the complaint about a university is not that we fomented it, that if anything, that we didn't resist it enough. Yeah, so, I mean, do you think it's the responsibility of the president of a university, the administration of a university, the marketing firms <laughs> that universities hire to call its students and its tuition-paying parents to something higher? Or is it, you know, at the end of the day, is it really just about tuition dollars? It is our responsibility to call them to something higher. Um, Yes, absolutely. I often tell students and their parents who come in and visit the school because this is the season where they're deciding where they want to go to college. Mm -hmm. And my job is to persuade them to come to the University of Tulsa and to say, I say to them many different aspects of the university will be appealing to them. But one of them is we want to teach wisdom. We want you to leave here understanding your place in the cosmos a bit better. And I think that's really important. And I think people resonate to that as well. You and I might disagree whether business is as kind of um, 
kind of crude as as um, some might make it to be, as Alan Bloom might make it to be, because I think it's actually kind of a fascinating discipline. And most disciplines, if you really immerse yourself in them, turn out to be extraordinarily fascinating and just some kind of sub-branch of anthropology or sociology and and philosophy for that matter. So, yeah, I think wisdom is what we're about. And when I tell people more casually that you come here and we'll offer you a transformative experience, you will leave here a different person. That is one way of saying that, that we will make you understand the world around you and yourself differently. And we will leave you with at least a roadmap toward wisdom, if not the culmination of it. Well, I mean, so one thing that Bloom really stresses, and I admire him for stressing this because I think it's true, is he thinks that when we reflect on education, when we think about education, and of course he's thinking of education in the very rich sense of paideia in the Greek tradition or bildung in the German tradition, where it's this idea of cultivating, you know, a person. So for, you know, cultivating a whole person, but at the university level in particular, you know, cultivating the mind. So that, because he sees a deep connection, right, between freedom and knowledge, there's no chance of being truly free, which is a, you know, to a significant extent, freedom is an interior condition. Obviously, you can, through coercion or some kind of violence, your freedom can be robbed from you, but you can be, you can be totally free externally and, and not be free in the relevant sense, right? Because that's a matter of cultivating the mind, because it's tied to knowledge. You're not really free if you don't understand the world and yourself, right? That I mean, that's just sort of the basis of wisdom or, or any anything like good deliberation or the crafting of a good life. And I think so he sees, you know, there is this natural human desire to know, right? And that what what any real education is, right, is the cultivation of that. And it can be cultivated through various disciplines, of course, but that has to be, it has to be a cultivation of that desire because it is the foundation of human freedom. And, you know, the traditional separation between the liberal and the servile arts, where the liberal arts were taken to be something higher um, not in an elitist sense, not in an aristocratic sense, but higher in the sense that it transcends time, place, and utility, right? So we're talking about seeking things that are good in themselves, right? So the organization of the world of work is important and it's necessary, right? And of course, it's a real, it's a, it's a real kind of practical knowledge. But it's not higher. And that, and that, if your, I don't know, your, your business life is going to be tied to human flourishing and not, say, rapacious greed or, or something else, then you have to do the work, right? The interior work of thinking about the higher things, the things that transcend that. What is the world of work and economy for what are you living for and what does a human life culminate i don't disagree with anything you said in my own education and what i wish for my son is to be steeped in the liberal arts irrespective of what vocation he chooses to make ends meet or i myself who's been a career in law politics the military now in higher education administration these are the fundamental disciplines i don't I don't disagree with you in any way. I think the question for Alan Bloom is, he's very cranky about certain things. Yes, he's super cranky. Yep. I think, honestly, for the depth of learning and obvious erudition that the book shows, he doesn't do a very good job of explaining the thought of these various people he invokes. You know, I'm convinced that you were the only person who read it back in 1987 because there aren't many people who can get through this discussion of 
German philosophy and the role of Weber or... But in 1987, I was in the second grade. (laughs) (laughs) A a prodigious. Yes, yes. You were up to the 19th century German. I was a bookwormy kid, but I wasn't quite that. But I don't think he does a very interesting job of explaining it. And uh, and he has some very controversial takes on these thinkers. He's without, a Straussian. Without alerting readers to the fact that he is in a minority view of these things. Trigger warning, I'm a Straussian. <laughs> and so you read the book, and you're thinking like, I've read better explications of the role of continental philosophy on American life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I've already been kind of turned off by the fact that he doesn't like Mick Jagger, who is the, as he says, the Napoleon of our time. And um, I said, I think it's a strange book that actually, if you read it, you might come away from there less convinced of the power of liberal arts in your life than if you hadn't read it at all. Mm, yeah. Okay. Well, that's it. That's a pretty, yeah, that's a pretty significant indictment. <laughs> it's actually doing more harm than good. Um, I guess I have a really strong cranky old man side. So maybe that wasn't so off putting to me. The Straussian stuff. I mean, anybody who listens to this podcast knows I'm not a Straussian, but if you're a new listener, I'm not a Straussian. Did you find his rock and roll criticism legit? I didn't. I don't think I read that part. So, so. He, I mean, he hates rock music in general yeah. as being, you know, the music of um, sexual freedom as opposed to I, I mean, classical I, music. Yeah, I mean, um, like I said, I mean, there's there are iterations of this. Like, this is a type. Like, Roger Scruton, who I also <laughs> enjoy reading, it's the same thing. And it's, like, easy to poke fun at, and I get it. I don't actually like Mick Jagger, but... I get that people do, but he obviously, I mean, look, he went through a series of pretty traumatic events in the academy in the 60s, so maybe he gets a pass for not thinking that was, like, the greatest generation, or Um, Why would you give him a pass? I don't understand that. I mean, he admits that rock music, for example, is one of the kind of cultural phenomena of post-World War II life, and... Yeah, I don't know why I would give him a pass on it, as opposed to him treating it just as kind of a triviality. I mean, you know, yeah. it seems like you could be like Roger Scruton and say like, hey, you know, classical music is far, far superior right. in depth and yeah. intellectuality, et cetera. Right. And that, sure, pop music is about dancing and it's related to sex, et cetera, yeah, as opposed to being like this cranky sense. kind of thing of <laughs> yeah. like, you know, it's the demolition of Western civilization that kids today like rock music. And that's, oh. that's just a part of it. But then he goes into all the Nietzsche and all this. In a way, you're leaving and you're like, what? I mean, if you didn't, hadn't read those guys and didn't yeah. know what they were saying, you would not leave the book more educated about, about it. And you might take the wrong things about what most people see these thinkers as being if you only read this book. Right. Well, that's true. But that's why you should always go back to the sources. I mean, so again, when I was a wee lass writing, reading this for the first time, you know, I hadn't read Rousseau, so I wasn't like, oh, he's wrong about Rousseau, but it made me want to read Rousseau. You know, you sort of see the significance, and I was also reading this alongside of McIntyre, uh, who I liked much better, but but I thought that, I don't know, I guess I value, like I said, I have a really high tolerance for the cranky old man <laughs> yelling at the sky. Um, Can I go back to your question? Like, You're the president of the University of Tulsa, or we create the University of... Um, you know, some town, like the University of Austin was created just this week as Mm -hmm. we record this. Mm -hmm. What's the Jennifer Frey curriculum? And what's not in there that most modern universities have? So, I mean, I I guess I would look for various models to imitate, and I would want it to be flexible. But I think the thing that would most guide a choice of curriculum is this idea of what kind of mind or person, right, are, are we trying to cultivate? And I think that that curriculum should be designed with the idea that this desire to know has to be shaped and cultivated and channeled towards the most essential things. Um, and that can leave room eventually for, you know, practical trades. I'm, I'm not opposed to that. 
What I am opposed to is the reality of the contemporary university where you can enter a business school from day one and really pretty much be on that track. You take a couple of meaningless requirements that are gen ed and that end up being very haphazard and cobbled together. You might never take a class in philosophy or history or literature. That seems like a problem to me. And and those core curriculum classes that you're forced to take, nobody really tells you why you're taking them. Nobody helps you to integrate that into the thing you're actually studying, which is accounting or marketing or fashion design or whatever. And so I think that's a that's a profound disservice to students because really they're learning in many cases a set of skills that will be obsolete in six years anyway. Um, no, I'll accept that, um, and I would agree with everything you said there. I think what I'm interested in though is Bloom. Is well when you read Bloom or in hearing maybe your own comments about it is like, why is this happening? Why has this coherence? disappeared. And I guess the question to you as a professional philosopher is, aren't the philosophers in the vanguard of the revolution? Do they believe in the coherency of the story? Or, yeah. or is the relativism that Bloom decries actually starting in the philosophy department and spreading from there? So you all have lost the faith. It's not that we've forgotten about you. It's that we listened to you closely <laughs> and believed what you said. And therefore, yeah. the world around you is as your discipline made it. No, I'm sorry. You cannot blame the philosophers this time. <laughs> no, because we have too little power, um, really, to be blamed for much of anything. Um, I, no, I don't think that, I don't think that there is an, an empirical case you, you can make for that story. Um, I think that I, I will acknowledge, though, and I have acknowledged in print that I think, you know, philosophy has been corrupted in, in various ways. And in, in part, that's because its home is is now in in the university. And it wasn't always its home. In fact, for most of the history of the philosophy, it didn't find its home in the university. It's, but the the kind of unreflective model of knowledge in the university now is expertise, and that's a terrible model for philosophy. We're really not experts, and if we are experts, we're experts in things that are funny to talk about experts. I mean, like, what does it mean to be an expert in ethics? What does that mean? Does that mean that if you have a moral problem, I'll come in and be like, well, a Kantian would say this, and Mill would say this. I mean, that's not going to help you solve your problems. Nobody, nobody, like could possibly address an actual moral dilemma in their life by reading, like, a text in normative theory. But this is the model, you know, in order for philosophers to get a tenure-track job, to get to full professor, to, you know, do the things that they need to succeed qua academic, they need to show that they can produce the kinds of specialized research that is valued in the contemporary university. And so that puts the philosopher in a tough position because philosophy is the kind of thing that is slow. It took Kant a long time to write those three critiques. Like he would not have, <laughs> that's not a path to tenure, <laughs> figuring out the Copernican revolution. And so philosophers really aren't given the time or the space to think in a systematic way anymore. And we don't. If you look at the philosophy job market, if you look at philosophy grad schools, we have specialists. And in fact, we have hyper specialists. So even if you're an expert in metaphysics, like, do you work on this or that? Right. And, and you have to do the same sorts of stuff. I mean, really what happens is philosophers end up trying to ape the sciences because scientific expertise is the gold standard. And our tenure files are evaluated on a, by a university committee. And most of the time, there's not another philosopher sitting on that committee, right? So we have to we have to look legit, right, to a bunch of other specialists, and that that's the reality under which we operate. Can I push you back on that? Because I don't know that I fully agree with that. It's the world you created in lots of ways. I mean, 
a story you're telling to me, if I distill it down, is that these, there are lots of philosophers out there who are interested in how the big things connect to the other big things and the meta-narratives of life. Um, you believe that, I know. Alan Bloom believes that. But if I went to the philosophy faculty at Harvard or Yale or any leading institution in the country, I doubt most people would agree that, you know, I'm interested in kind of the the big stories of life, you know, that you're fascinated by, that you think are so essential. I mean, the discipline itself, right, as Bloom recounts, Nietzsche, Heidegger, um, Adorno, Horkheimer, all of these, Marcuse, all of these people come through your departments, the philosophy departments, into this country from Germany, bringing ideas with them. And the discipline itself doesn't believe, right, in the telos of life. Right, but you're agreeing with me when you say that. Uh, no, I'm agreeing with you, but I'm saying yeah. this is a world you created. It's not that the philosophers are like, oh, I really want to be writing about human flourishing. It's that most philosophers today, reflecting the broader culture, don't believe there's anything interesting to say about human flourishing because they too are the um, relativists that Bloom sees in his students. The students are just downwind in a crass form of what is happening in the ivory tower. Yeah, so I think it depends on, so um, I, don't, I don't think Bloom really dwells on this. But, you know, there is this kind of analytic continental split within philosophy, the analytic tradition coming out of Frege and Russell, sort of reaching its institutional flowering at Oxford and Cambridge, and then, you know, comes over to the States. And then Heidegger and Horkheimer and Marcuse, this is in the continental tradition. And I was always in analytic departments, right? So if so, so if somebody wants to like pick me out, <laughs> I'm an Anglo-American analytic philosopher, right? And there it's not that relativism took hold, but a conception of truth that is kind of deflationary. So truth becomes just a property of propositions and is mostly just a matter of logic. And if that's your conception of truth, then talking about a natural desire to seek the truth, it's going nowhere. And so, so I completely agree that contemporary philosophy is, in some important respects, untethered from its traditions. But, yeah. But I isn't mean, that what you and Bloom are arguing? It's not that we didn't listen to philosophy is that we listen to the wrong philosophers. Well, no, I don't think so. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's easy to take this in a thousand different directions and I don't want to get off course, but I don't think, I, I just think it's too easy to say, well, you know, the trouble is we listen to the philosophers. I mean, the truth is we never really had any significant power here. Now, I don't, you know, I, it's funny because you're a professional philosopher and I am far from it. Um, but I have more faith than you do, it seems, in the power of ideas, right? So whether it's the philosophy department or more generally ideas that came from great thinkers, this line you can track from Rousseau, Marx, Nietzsche, Darwin, Freud, Frankfurt School, right? these ideas have profoundly, and Bloom talks a bit about this, right? It's entered the lexicon, terms like, you know, self, and um, yeah. that which are which are relatively new, right? Right to the English language, right? Do come in some bastardized form from these thinkers, right? They profoundly yeah. affected how we see ourselves, and that's affected, of course, the culture. Yes, and the university invariably, right, is a mirror to that culture, um, and maybe that's the complaint that it's not leaning in enough to that. But that becomes a very explicitly political stand. And you do come close to like the University of Austin, where mm. right you're making a stand against the broader culture. Right. Yeah. Okay. Good. So I absolutely do not want to deny the power of ideas. They are very powerful. But I just think that the story about how ideas take hold is way more complicated than saying we listen to the philosophers. <laughs> yeah. So may maybe I'll just leave it there. One thing that I do want to talk about is, so 
Bloom ends his book on a very kind of dark, pessimistic note. And he basically says, yeah, so this vision that I have for higher education, it really has no chance. You know, I've, I'm not an idiot. I don't think anybody's going to make the kind of university that I think is a, is a true university. And the best that we can hope for is that the embers of this fire, this fire of real paideia, do not burn out. I really wish I could ask Alan Bloom if he thinks the embers have died out. I suspect he might say that they have, um, but of course I don't know, and he's dead, and I can't ask him. But I, but I do want to ask you because you are a very new president at an institution that stands at a crossroads, and you have a vision for this university. How hopeful are you about higher education? Have the embers died out where, I mean, what's your mood, maybe, is my question. I'm broadly a cultural pessimist, I suppose, while being a university optimist, right? And that maybe is one of the exciting things about being a university president is that you do get to keep the embers, right, till another day arises, that you can pursue a different world, right, that is, well, frankly, almost countercultural today, right, and that you can keep those kind of things alive until a day arises maybe when they are more valued than they are today. You know, to be a writer who I know you love, who I would recommend instead of Alan Bloom, like Alastair McIntyre. Yes. Right? That we yes, are, he's way better than Alan. That will be the saying. institutional St. Benedict that he calls for, you know, at the end of his book. Right. Uh-huh. And right that leads like a, a change of like valuation of mm-hmm. things, right? That's what a university that's what I'm excited about what a university can be. But I acknowledge that that is a specific and highly contestable vision mm-hmm. that most people might disagree with. Yeah, I mean I think maybe so, maybe a really good criticism of Bloom is that he has this vision, but he does a really poor job of attracting anyone to it. Because, you know, he's like too much of a grumpy old man and, you know, is admittedly, obviously, self-indulgent along a variety of dimensions. I mean, I don't, I'm not blind to that. So it's not. (laughs) He doesn't really explain to me, like, I think there are lots of people, young and old, who look at the culture around them and say, like, what went awry here exactly? You know, they have an intuition that something is wrong, but they can't mm-hmm. articulate it. Mm-hmm. And there are writers like Alistair McIntyre's one um, right, who offer a much more compelling, persuasive, and exhaustive saying, like, here's what went wrong mm-hmm. along the way. And like, so that's why I find it interesting. Bloom's take is both a little superficial mm-hmm. in his explanation. You don't leave there thinking, like, oh, I get it now. I figured mm-hmm. out like where we went awry. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, it's long and 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 <laughs> it, you know it's very it's kind of gnomic and just pa- you know, like it's like uh-huh. passing reference to Nietzsche and you're like, well, what what, what was Nietzsche saying about this? Right. Well, or Nietzsche and Weber, you know, that's like worth like twenty pages of explication. Right. How Weber is a Nietzschean, and you're like, oh, you know, if you don't know that ahead of time, mm-hmm. you're lost. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, well, maybe I can ask you this. I mean, what? What book on higher education do you recommend? Do you think is do you think is worth reading and discussing? What discussing whether it's you know a much older book um, or or something contemporary? I mean, um, if I could change your question just slightly, because as I've kind of alluded to here, the university and the culture are um, in a death grip with one another. And so the books I would recommend are about the culture more broadly because Mm -hmm. I do agree with Bloom that the university is a critical cultural institution. Mm -hmm. That's why Alistair McIntyre, we've already referenced, Charles Taylor, um, even like in a more journalistic form, the Rod Dreher's of the world, Mm. um, Carl Truman, right? Um, Very Mm -hmm. conservative, very controversial. But these are people who try to kind of give a genealogy of the self. Philip Reef, one of my most favorite writers, right? More difficult writer to deal with. I don't dense. know him. Who is that? <clears throat> um, married to Susan Sontag, famously, and divorced very early. But, oh, okay. you know, a biographer of Freud and um, a cultural critic. 
who is like looking at the world Wait, around Wait, are you talking about Peter Gay? No, no, not Peter Gay. Who's oh. great He's also a biographer. Oh, okay, so like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, that's no, the only... No, Peter Gay. Sorry. But Philip Reef, Triumph of the Therapeutic, he wrote in the 60s, and then oh, went okay. silent for 30 years, yeah. and then came out with a few books. But I mean, these are people who are like really grappling. When you read them, you're thinking like, okay, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Right. In a way that I didn't read Bloom and leave there thinking like, ah, oh, you know, the scales have been lifted. So I would say read those books, which are about the cultural moment. And from there, you can think like, okay. Well, which Charles Taylor? Are you thinking the secular age? Yeah, that would be one I would start with, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that one's really long. Just so much. It is also very long, right? <laughs> but I, mean, I think those are books like that are really interesting that Bloom is kind of derivative of, if you will, or uh-huh. a poor precursor in some cases for yeah. I mean, I suppose I'm going to stop defending Bloom because I really have no... Um, you just like his ideas. You don't defend the book. You just like his ideas. I do. I mean, I think that there are so few people that are willing to defend, you know, Paideia as a, you know, as as, as something that, as, as a vision of, of education. And so maybe my appreciation is coming out of that. But then also he's so associated with... The University of Chicago and the great books core there, which I myself taught in and found transformative just as a teacher. I mean, that that was the first time. So when I was a junior fellow in the Society of the Liberal Arts there, it was the first time that I ever taught a great books curriculum. And it was incredible. It was absolutely incredible. And it's really hard to go back to another kind of teaching after that because... It, it just, it's such a rich, it's its just such a rich experience. And so so maybe part of my attraction to the book is just that he is standing up for that and standing up for the value of the experience of undergoing that with other people. And another aspect of Bloom that I really deeply appreciate, which I haven't brought up yet, is that he sees the university as a real society, a real society in the sense that the members of the society are organized according to their directedness to a common goal, right? So they have shared activities. They have a shared self-conception of one another's working towards this common goal. And, and he thinks that when you participate in a real society, you're in the space of friendship. And so one of the things that he connects is the value of intellectual friendship. And the university is the place where intellectual friendships can begin and flourish and continue once you've left the university. And I think that we have lost sight of that, right? That the special kind of love, (laughs) right? Because friendship is is a special kind of love between human beings there is an intellectual friendship that is actually incredibly deep and meaningful and that universities are not, they don't seem interested in fostering anymore. I mean, I think universities are very explicitly, have very explicitly rejected any model of community life, right? We have, we were talking about this this morning. We have budget models according to which we're engaged in a Hobbesian war of all against all, right, for, for finite resources, namely tuition dollars and students. And so, of course, we don't see ourselves as a, as a real society, as a community. We're fighting each other, like, very explicitly. And, and so, again, you know, I think that what, what gets lost in, in all of this is any idea that we're working not just for discrete, isolated research outputs, right, that redound back on us ultimately that reflect our ambitions or whatever. But like we're actually striving for a common good, right? Which is some unified body of knowledge that we are participating in according to the methods of our own discipline, right? But there's there's a contribution being made that is greater than ourselves. No, I like that vision, and I would love to recreate that at the University of Tulsa. I think the question is, is there a common good that people would go for, even if you structure the university in such a way that they were permitted to do so? And I think that's what I'm maybe more skeptical of than you, is that 
there is no common good, short of you know the relativism that is one of the solutions to diverging views of what the common good might be. Well, why wouldn't the common good be this unified body of knowledge or just truth, right? I mean, truth is not a competitive good. I don't disagree, but many, maybe most would, don't you think? Well, I mean, yeah. So I recently had a discussion with another university president in which he denied that truth was like really even a thing. Um, and so we had a back and forth and... And I just said to him, well, then what are we doing? I mean, what are we doing? Are we just making money? Like, what, what are we doing if, if, we're not, if we're not dedicating ourselves to the good of the intellect? What are we doing? Well, I guess someone could argue that they're trying to show you what competing conceptions of truth might look like. Right? Your education will see, like, you know, here's what Jennifer Frey's view is. Here's Brad Carson's view. Here is, you know, a Chinese view of this question or a Confucian view. I mean, yeah. I guess that's one role you might see for education. Yeah. So, okay. So good. So, but there we're talking about theories of truth. But your theory of truth is either true or false, right? I mean, the thing is, truth is, and this is something that Bloom sees really clear. Truth is the good of the intellect. It is when we talk about a desire to know, right? that is part of human nature, that is permanent, that it is the purpose of an education to cultivate, right? We're talking about a desire that has an object and a measure, an object and a measure, and that is truth. Well, I'm deeply sympathetic. Don't you think that your viewpoint is in a deep minority and kind of among academics, certainly, but in the cultural moment we live in. Yes, that, it that, absolutely that, is. It that a- most people are like, no, that is not the way it is. Yes. No, I I, I will absolutely concede <laughs> that because it is 100% true. Yeah. Yeah, so I think it comes back to where maybe you and I do have a slight disagreement, which is fundamentally the problem is in our ideas. It wasn't that we became too mercenary and pushed business school or cared about student credit hours. It's that there was a war of ideas in in our country, and a certain side prevailed in that. Mm-hmm. And they um, are reflected in the corridors of power at universities, in Congress, mm-hmm. in the media, elsewhere. And your viewpoint, which is laudable, you know, is um, you're fighting a rear guard action in lots of ways, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. And I said, I love it. It's terrific. And I'm sympathetic <laughs> in many, many ways. Yeah. But, but it's a, there was a war, and your side lost. Oh, for sure. Yep. And that's why Alistair Mack, they'd all agree with you on that score, right? Yeah, but. and that's why I, you know, I have like a very healthy sympathy for cranky old men. <laughs> I don't look like a cranky old man, but inside, I kind of am. Have the soul of a cranky I old do. man? <laughs> I do. I, well, I don't think so. Well, yeah. No, I don't really. But I like, I get it. It like, it resonates. I understand. I mean, I think like a Bloom or some of these other folks who are less cranky, could at least be sympathetic to like why these ideas are powerfully appealing. The ideas they reject are powerfully appealing to people, right? The notion of the self and um, expressive individualism, you know, emotivism. Oh, sure. Right. These are like very powerful, powerfully appealing things. Illusions are powerful. They're incredibly powerful, and I mean that's why the real value of submitting yourself to something that transcends yourself truth, goodness, beauty, is that you realize that there is something beyond you to which you are held to account. So it's not all about you, right? And if and if you can't recognize something like that in your life, then I think you're in real trouble because the human propensity for self-flattery, for self-deception, for illusion, for fantasy is very strong. It's very strong. And you don't have to, it's not a religious claim. Freud saw it and St. Paul saw it too. Like there just is, what does T.S. Eliot say? Human beings cannot bear much reality. That is true, right? And that is why you have to cultivate the inner dispositions right. to bear it with courage, with humility. So is your complaint though, because you've said before on Twitter, and you have a terrific tr- Twitter account, that you're a critic of the contemporary university. Yeah. It seems to me you're a critic of the contemporary culture. That's clearly true. Yeah. Of which 
it's just it's it's redundant to say you're therefore a critic of the university. You're, but but when you say that, it's like you're singling out like this institution. As I look across the landscape, has gone awry. <laughs> Your view is now the world has gone awry. Well, that's true. That's fair. And the university is just on the in that world. Yeah. No, that's fair. Yes, that's fair. I just talk about universities because it's my life. So I have a more sort of intimate knowledge of this particular institution of modernity, but I could have picked another one. I mean, do you think, do you agree with Bloom? Because Bloom does say that the university is the most important institution, right? He believes that. Do you think that's true? That is such a great question. And I am hesitating. I don't know. I'd really have to think about that. I don't know. I don't know if I agree with that because I can think of a thousand reasons why I shouldn't agree with that. And I just don't know. I mean, do you think also, I'm interested because... It's very important. You know, like when Alan Bloom talks about his own growing up and how when he went to the University of Chicago as a student, this was revelatory to him, right? He was sitting at the feet of these great men, yeah. mostly men, who changed his world. Yeah. Today, I can go on YouTube and find that guy. You know, my son who's in high school watches fantastic philosophers, thinkers, right, talk about the way the world works. Um, he doesn't need to go... Well, that wasn't available to me in my lifetime mm. in a small town. Yeah, so yes and no. So YouTube is uh, can be great. It can also be awful, but it can be great. And you can, in a sense, um, you can pick up a lot of information from YouTube, but I don't think it's a substitute for the university because what you don't get is the relationship with your professor, right? Who And many of my professors were mentors to me, they were models for me of the intellectual life. They gave me an imaginative path. Like, I can see myself being like you. I want, in fact, to be like you. And also many of them became my friends. So you would be missing that. And that is huge because you actually, the intellectual life is inc incredibly hard, actually, and demanding. And... That is why, you know, intellectual friendship is so important because without the friendship, I think you lose the joy. And, and, and really, I mean, for true education, and I think Bloom sees this, like true education is about the, the fulfillment of desire. And it should be the source of a kind of very deep and serious kind of happiness. Like, like real happiness. That's interesting. Um, I think I agree with all of that. But I still find it interesting that going to the University of Chicago was once essential to a young American boy or girl. Because growing up, even in Chicago, routinely somewhere, or much less a smaller town, if you wanted an explication of Plato, there was no one there to give it to you. You couldn't even find the book. True. Right? Now I can go online and find people who walked me through Marx's Capital, like, you know, with 50 lectures on it. And these are world-class experts. And so the value proposition of universities, to that extent, has declined. Mm -hmm. right? Yes, the collegiality and these things are still important, but they're not as essential in that respect, right, as they were. They were once, they had a monopoly mm. on these kind of rare resources that have now become democratized. Yeah, but I guess I would say in response... Um, that philosophy in particular isn't just like facts. Like you're not really doing philosophy if somebody like tells you a bunch of true things about capital, right? And, and you can regurgitate them back. That's not philosophy. That's maybe history or, or something like that. And that's important and valuable to be able to say, you know what Mark said. But philosophy is like talking about whether it's true. Is it true? <laughs> right? That labor is a surplus of, or w whatever it is. It's been so long since I've read <laughs> Marx. I'm sorry. But, well, as Bloom says, no one reads Marx anymore. No, I really did read Marx, but it just fell out of my brain. So, I mean, right, is it true? And that is a kind of, that that is an exchange. Like, philosophy is something you do. So, you're not really doing philosophy if you're just, like, if you find a lecture of mine on YouTube and you enjoy it, that's great, but you didn't do philosophy. Do you think most of your colleagues in the philosophy departments are interested in what is true? I would hope so. I certainly know that my husband is. <laughs> <laughs> because you're like-minded. <laughs> my sense is 
that most people are not. And it's not because that's not a, a slur on them. It's that that question seems quaint. Well, I mean, yeah. So even my even my dear friend Zena Hitz will not talk about truth. Really? We, oh, we have gone rounds about this. In her book, Last and Pet, you'll never the word truth doesn't show up. Is that, she and she she's explicitly said, you know, it just puts people off. So it's more of a marketing scheme. She believes in truth, but doesn't believe that you can talk about it in polite company. Because I read yeah. the book, but you're right. Yeah. But she believes in truth. She believes that it exists. Oh, for sure. She just doesn't think, but she just sort of thinks you have to like kind of like meet people where they are and they're not ready to hear that word. That's your Straussian for you. And uh, <laughs> and I just, I'm a more blunt person, I guess. It's definitely true. Yeah. So anyway. Okay. Oh, gosh. We're over time. Well, Brad, this is really fun. Thank you for coming on. And thank you for being at the University of Tulsa. We're excited to have you here. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. You have been listening to Sacred and Profane Love, a philosophy, theology, and literature podcast that is generously underwritten by the Institute of Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America and produced by Catholics for Hire, a group of young Catholic digital content freelancers. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Just go to www.patreon.com slash eudaimoniapod to become a monthly patron for as little as $2 per month. For our next episode, I'll be joined by the philosopher Kevin Combo to discuss Sophocles' Oedipus Rex. Until then, friends, be well and keep reading.